your king There's power in the blood Power in the blood Would you give daily His praises to sing There's wonderful power in the blood There's power, power Wonder working power In the blood Of the Lamb There's power, power Wonder working power In the precious blood
gonna try and do a new song. What? Yeah. Sorry.
thousands elsewhere here on this earth. God, that it's about eternal fulfillment, never-ending joy. God, we thank you that no matter how much we strive, we're just circling after the truth that it's you, Jesus. God, it's all about you. It's all about your death, Jesus, your resurrection, the gospel that you took all our sin on yourself and you paid, it, paid our wages, God. our debts, God. So we just give you our lives, God. Yes, you just bless this time so we gather together in our homes in this church, wherever we're listening right now. Just help us to help us just to see what you're doing, God, and what you're calling us to do. Just to give you our lives, God. Good morning, family. It's good to gather with you. My preference is to gather with you. Even though we practice social distancing, we're together, and that's what counts. Blessings to you. I'd like to um, say Happy Father's Day to the fathers out there. I, uh, I want to read a uh, oh, out of Exodus the command with a promise. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. It's a great promise, and we do honor our fathers today. Um, fathers, your children, no matter what their age, will always, you will always be important to them. Um, I, I recognize that in my own life, uh, even though I have a daughter that's older than she should be for my age. I'm still young. Um, we have a crack team working on the uh, live streaming, so we will eventually uh, get to that point where there will be live streaming uh, of the, our morning service. So uh, those that uh, would like to be online. And our small groups are starting uh, together again. So uh, if you're in a small group, you might contact the leader if you haven't been contacted. And we do practice social distance distancing um, guidelines in those small groups. Our beloved coach, Cheek, his memorial service will be held here at the church sanctuary and an overflow um, room in the gym on Saturday, June 27th at 2 p.m. There will be a limit of 100 people per building at the time. But if you prefer to watch it online, the service will be streamed on the HSU Athletics page, as well as their Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. So anybody anywhere in the world will be able to partake, and I imagine there will be hundreds, if not thousands, online watching uh, uh, that service. We won't be passing offering plates again today, but uh, don't be dismayed. If you would like to bring your, uh, or give your tithes and offerings, you can do uh, by land mail, U.S. Postal Service. Or if you are coming to the church office on Tuesday through Thursday, uh, from 10 to 2, you can drop it off and say hi to Sherry. I was reminded by Millie that um, there is a drop slot in the door, so if you miss those particular times and show up, you can still drop it through the door uh, at the church. You can give online by the church website or there's an offering box in the inner hallway, just beyond the, uh, the outer wall right there, uh, between the lobby and the sanctuary. So there's a box there to place your uh, offering envelope. Pastor?
Well, good morning, saints. It is uh, a wonderful day to celebrate our Heavenly Father. Uh, every day should be Father's Day when it comes to celebrating Him in our lives and giving Him thanks for who He is and all that He has done. Well, would you uh, bow your head and pray with me uh, for a moment? Father, we do celebrate you. We pray that every day would you be your day that we would acknowledge you and honor you. And Father, as we approach your word today, we pray as always that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you would have to say to us uh, individually as well as corporately. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Well, as a student uh, and teacher of the Bible, I am always looking for resources that will help me learn and in turn communicate to others the truths that are found throughout the pages of the Bible. And such is the case as we study together through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, right now I am uh, currently reading theologian Dallas Willard's book, The Divine Conspiracy which uh, is based upon the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And I am also uh, reading numerous uh, commentaries and other uh, resources as well. But I have to confess that some Bible teachers, for some reason, just skip through the Sermon on the Mount. They really don't uh, meditate much on it, uh, certainly don't marinate uh, on it uh, as it should be. And yet, check this out. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest message that is recorded in all of Jesus' teaching. And coming in second is Jesus' teaching on the last days in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus' most in-depth teaching focused on the present, the here and now, how we live out the kingdom of God. But his second most in-depth teaching focused on the future. Hmm. Maybe, just maybe, we should be focusing on both of those things as well. So, we have been slowly looking at the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. We've taken one week each to look at the, the, the Beatitudes, and, and we've looked at the importance of the Beatitudes, and then last week we piggybacked off of the Beatitudes and we talked about the importance of our Christian witness here in the world, and how Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, if you were not able to uh, listen to that message uh, last week, I would encourage you to uh, visit the church's Facebook page or the church website and uh, uh, listen to this message about us being salt to the earth and light to the world. It's very uh, important. Now, this morning, we're going to look at what I am entitling Jesus versus the law. But as we're going to discover, it really isn't Jesus versus the law. Um, and when you hear about that title, the law, um, it might be easy to wonder why even bother talking about the law. If there was ever a part of the Sermon on the Mount to skip over, it would certainly be this passage, right? 
Well, first of all, to think that way is to really not understand the law and in turn not understand Jesus' relationship to the law and how they are actually connected. Second, anything that Jesus has to say is worthy of our attention. We need the whole counsel of Jesus, not just the stuff we like, and not just the stuff that we pick and choose from. Can I get an amen? And so, this morning we pick up in our study, chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 17 through 20. Again, chapter 5, 17 through 20. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, notice, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. What a powerful passage of Scripture. And one that is really vital for us as Christians to understand. It is here that Jesus connects the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And he starts out by saying, Do not think that I came to abolish or destroy the law or the prophets. Now, the law is referring to the law of Moses. The first five books of the Bible is called the Pentateuch. And the prophets is speaking of a group of books in the Old Testament known as the major prophets and the minor prophets. So it makes up a lot of the Old Testament. Now, it's important to know that the law had three aspects to it. The first is a ceremonial aspect, the how-tos of the law, how to prepare a sacrifice, how to perform a sacrifice, how to present a sacrifice, the how-tos. The second aspect was dietary. This dealt with what you could and couldn't eat. For example, you could eat grasshoppers, but you couldn't eat lobster or bacon. Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. And then the third aspect was the moral aspect of the law, which is mostly seen in the Ten Commandments. Now, James 
told us in James 2.10 that if we, get this, if we have broken just one commandment of the law, we have violated or broken them all. And then James goes on to teach us about the law of liberty and, and, and the law of love. Now, Jesus goes on in the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us that not one dot or tittle will pass away until everything has been accomplished. So, not even the smallest comma. Until. That word until is important. Well, the until in many ways has happened. And so here is the deal. This is what Jesus is trying to communicate. Moses delivered the law, whereas Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. The only person to ever live and fulfill the law is Jesus. Jesus not only fulfilled the law, but as we see here, he helped to explain and to clarify the law and how it applies to our lives in the New Covenant theology. The Apostle Paul tells us that the law served as a tutor to lead us to Christ. He also said in Romans chapter 13, verses, excuse me, Romans 3, verses 19 through 23, these words, Romans 3, starting in verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Now, this is very important. Notice what Paul says is the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to prick our conscience. The purpose of the law is to reveal that we're guilty of breaking the law. The purpose of the law is so that no one can boast and say, oh yeah, I've, I've fulfilled the law. No one can say, get this, that, that, that I am a good person. And so they don't need Jesus. They can go to heaven on their own merit. What Paul is saying, what Jesus is saying, get this, is that the law is a mirror that reveals our true self. That is its purpose. Now, Jesus, as I said, is the fulfillment of the law. The, the word fulfill, it means to fulfill requirements. And that word requirements is important. For example, say you come across a job opening in a field that you're interested in. And in this job opening post, they share with you the different requirements necessary for fulfilling the role that this job pertains. And so say that they say, well, first of all, you have to have a master's degree. So that's going to automatically eliminate some people. Number two, you must have three years of experience in the field that you're working in. Next, 
you must be competent in these specific areas. And they'll list off whatever it is that is important. Now, if you do not have a master's degree, or maybe you have a master's degree, but you don't have three years of experience, or you're not competent in the fields required, it is very doubtful that you'll even have the opportunity for an interview. Why? Because you don't, what? Fulfill the requirements, you see. And so here's the deal. When Jesus died <laughs> upon the cross and rose from the dead, he fulfilled all the requirements of the law. And so that's why we no longer have to perform sacrifices. Jesus became our ultimate and our eternal sacrifice, you see. And this was vividly demonstrated when Jesus died and the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom as Jesus cried out, It is finished, you see. It's why we do not meticulously follow the Sabbath today. Because according to Hebrews, in Jesus, get this, Every day is a Sabbath day in Christ. He is the one who gives us rest from our works. Why? Because He fulfills the law. Now, Paul, he simplified this. He simplified our understanding of how the law works. When in Galatians 5.14, he said this. Could you just pause a moment and pray for me? I'm having some uh, health issues here. Nothing coronavirus related. Paul said this, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, that you love your neighbor, how? As yourself. And as I shared here earlier, the Sermon on the Mount teaches us how to love. You see, guys, please get this, the law was always, always intended to lead us and teach us to love. That was its ultimate destination. That's why we're no longer under the law. We are now under Jesus. We are now under the law of love. So, because He is God, Jesus is the giver of the law. We see here that Jesus affirms the law. We've seen that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus addressed the Pharisees saying, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. That in the law, you have eternal life. But it is these that testify about me. Remember after Jesus' death and resurrection, there was a couple of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared to them and started walking along with them. And he soon discovered that they were confused, that they were sad, that they were filled with doubt. And Scripture tells us this, 
and explaining to them the law and the prophets and how they spoke of him. You see, the law is all about Jesus. The prophets is all about Jesus. And Jesus says in verse 19, whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice that Jesus affirms the teaching of the Old Testament law and prophets. And he says that those who neglect the Old Testament are still saved, but they will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. There was a popular uh, pastor a while back who encouraged all of his listeners to unhitch the Old Testament from their Christian faith. And he either misspoke or misunderstands our need for the entirety of Scripture, the whole counsel of God, you see. And Jesus' here, words here in verse 19 is a great encouragement to me. Because I may never be considered a great teacher here on earth, but guess what? I will be considered a great teacher in the kingdom of heaven. And that is motivation enough for me to continue teaching out of the Old Testament. So when we get into the Old Testament again, whenever it's going to be, rejoice. Because you'll be considered great in the kingdom of heaven just by being taught from the Old Testament. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it in your devotions. It all works. It all ties together. And then in verse 20, Jesus says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that sounds pretty intimidating, doesn't it? Because supposedly the scribes, the Pharisees, they were pretty righteous dudes, right? Or at least they wanted you to think so. But therein lies the problem. Because they wanted you to think so. Jesus is pointing here to people's hearts, not people's performance. And he points to people's hearts like he always does. You see, the Pharisees were righteous outwardly, but their hearts were stained with sin and corruption inwardly. Theirs was a show. And Jesus is saying to us that righteousness is more than an outward show like the scribes and like the Pharisees. It has to be, listen, an inward reality that flows from our hearts, you see. And when it becomes an inward reality based upon a desire to please God rather than an outward show to impress man, then our righteousness will exceed that of the Pharisees. <laughs> Once again, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you pray with me? Oh God, Teach us these truths, we pray. Help us not be those who are like the Pharisees, the scribes, but that our faith, our relationship with you is the real deal. That's what it's all about. The inward witness of our hearts and our spirit with yours not the outward display of religious actions, works, and deeds. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. And should you be listening to this today or maybe online and you've confused things, <laughs> maybe you realize that you're more like the Pharisees and the scribes. It's all religion. It's all outward displays and going to church and being a moral person, yada, yada. Right here. In the heart. This is where the kingdom of God lives. And once it's there, then it can be displayed outwardly in the right way, in the powerful way. So I want to encourage you, give your heart to Jesus. Ask Him to save you from religion. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin of self-righteousness. The belief that you can enter into heaven on your own good merit. And ask Him to give you His Holy Spirit and a future and a hope. The best deal ever. Well, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he be with you in your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Have a wonderful day.
pray that we would just hold on to you, God, in all things, that we would just let our boast be in you, Jesus. Let our hope be in you, our everything in you. God, you will never be shaken, and we just, uh, we just walk out of here confident in you, not in ourselves or our, our knowledge, but in who you are, God. So we just pray that you'd go with us, Lord. be with us and always say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.